Bellator Fighting Championship touches down in Canada for the first time. We take a look at some of the world's biggest jiu-jitsu players. I'm twice as dangerous without the heat. And titles are on the line in the sweet science. It's for real. This is Fight Network's preview show. I think uh, it's, a, it's a big achievement. I'm Sarah Davis, and you're watching Fight Network's preview show. It's all about MMA, jiu-jitsu, and boxing on this show. So our analysts, John Ramdeen and Corey Erdman, will join me shortly to break down the fights. Now, Bellator Fighting Championships is making their way north of the border this weekend for the first time, and they'll hold part two of their Summer Series Featherweight Tournament at Casino Rama in Rama, Ontario. We're starting off with a look at a fight that was supposed to take place between two fighters that tournament participants should be paying close attention to. Joe Warren! The main event for Bellator 47 was a much anticipated rematch between Team Nogueira pupil Patricio Pitbull Frete and Bellator featherweight champion Joe Warren. However, a hand injury would keep the Pitbull on a leash and the fight would eventually be scrapped from the card. While fans lose out on one of the most entertaining featherweight matchups in the promotion's history, it's the Brazilian who suffers the most, not just because of how competitive their first encounter was in the Season 2 featherweight tournament final. Joe Warren on the feet and it was fight. Good right hand. Good right hand. With his title defense now next, Warren has elected to drop a weight class and entered the Season 5 Bantamweight Tournament. Entering the Bantamweight Tournament and you weigh 135 in this country, you better watch out because I'm coming for you. Should Warren emerge as the tournament champion, this could delay the Pitbulls rematch even further. Fans may just have to wait a little longer to see these two powerhouses go to war yet again. In a featherweight semifinal bout, Pat Curran will face Ronnie Mann. Curran has fought with Bellator five times since 2010, going 4-1, and one, and most recently submitted Luis Palomino with a Peruvian necktie in June. Mann is riding a four-fight winning streak and knocked out Adam Schindler in the first round of his quarterfinal. Uh, the thing with Pat, I've trained with Pat in the past when I, you know, when I worked with Jeff Curran, it, it, uh, his cousin, it, it's, it, he's got so much power. Ronnie Mann is probably the most technical fighter I've ever trained, and that's talking about guys like Vitor Belfort, Randy Couture, all those guys. He is the most technical fighter I've ever trained. Yeah, I see it being a war. I see this going to the decision, but I see Ronnie coming out with his hand raised. Losing is the worst thing that can, that can happen. I hate losing. And even though I lost against Eddie Alvarez, I walked away with a lot of knowledge, and, and I know what I need to improve on to become a future champion. After losing a hard-fought decision to Bellator lightweight champion Eddie Alvarez, 23-year-old Pat Curran dropped down to his natural weight class of 145 pounds and filled the final spot in the featherweight tournament. In his quarterfinal matchup at Bellator 46, Curran showcased more power and a much improved ground game, dispatching Florida-based XFC champion Luis Palomino with a Peruvian necktie in the first round. A Peruvian necktie versus the Peruvian Luis Palomino. The win earned the Illinois native his spot in the semifinals. Earlier that evening on the same event, 24-year-old Ronnie Mann looked to make a statement in his quarterfinal matchup against Adam Schindler after winning a decision over Joshua Rosho in his Bellator debut. Needing just 4 minutes and 14 seconds, Kid Ninja proved his worth, knocking out the Strikeforce veteran in emphatic fashion. That is it! Cool as you like on that finish by Ronnie Mann! He is through to the semifinal! Curran will likely use his wrestling to neutralize Mann's stand-up, similar to the strategy he employed against Alvarez. Someone's going to go to sleep in this fight and it's not going to be me. Meanwhile, look for Mann to go for another knockout. You know, I'm here to make him look like an amateur. Bad mouse oh, Good head kick! Should Curran emerge victorious, he will make Bellator history by becoming a two-time tournament finalist in two different weight classes. Either way, fans can expect fireworks as both fighters are well-versed in all areas and both possess devastating power. The only thing on my mind is become a world champion. I want to be the best fighter in the world. My goal here at Bellator is to get that belt. I don't care who they put in front of me. I don't care how long it takes me, but I'm here to get that belt and that belt is going to be mine. John Ramdeen, our MMA analyst, joins me now. John, you are excited for Bellator, aren't you? Not really. Of course Come I on. am. Of course <laughs> I am. Pat Curran and Ronnie Mann, this is going to be an epic battle. No doubt about it, about it, two of the best featherweights in the world, they are going to collide. They're going to put on a spectacular show for the fans. And both fighters are on a roll after having spectacular performances in their quarterfinal bouts. 
who has the edge and why? Holy smokes, this is a very competitive matchup. We have to give the edge to Ronnie Mann. Everybody I've spoken to, uh, the Team Tompkins camp, they are blown away at the abilities of Ronnie Mann. This kid is a very young, he's very experienced, he has heavy hands. Sean Tom Tompkins says he has the best Muay Thai he's ever seen in mixed martial arts. So very highly touted is Ronnie Mann. And his ground game is simply spectacular. He's a brown belt who trains with world champion Braulio Estima. This kid is very well-rounded. And of course, Pat Curran has all the skills available. He has also big power in his hands. So it's going to be an interesting matchup, but you have to give the edge to Kid Ninja. I think he is the complete package. Down the road, you will see him in the UFC probably challenging for a title. And how do you think he could win this? He's got to keep this fight standing. Of course, Pat Curran, he's no slouch on the ground, but he has big power. I think Ronnie Mann can use his technique to keep Pat Curran on the outside and punish him there. I don't know if he'll be able to take him out, but if he wins on points, he'll get his arm raised in victory. Brazilian Marlon Sandro will throw down with Argentinian Nazarino Maligari in the other featherweight semifinal tilt. Sandro has never been stopped in his career and is most recently coming off a decision win over Janer da Silva. Meligari's only loss came in his debut with the promotion, but he won his quarterfinal bout by submitting Jacob de Vries by way of guillotine choke in the third round. Hardcore MMA fans salivated at the mouth when Bellator signed former Sengoku featherweight champion Marlon Sandro to the promotion. I'm here at Bellator to become champion, and it doesn't matter who they put in front of me, I'll win. I'll be the world champion. Living up to the Bellator mandate of, where title shots are earned, not given, Sandro was paired in a quarterfinal matchup against unheralded 10 and 3 Brazilian Janeiro da Silva. No need to step in right now. Good right hand by Sandro. Good left hook. Despite going the distance in a split decision, Sandro has advanced to the semifinals and is now paired with 20 and 1 Argentinian Nazarino Malagare. Straight right hand and the left by the Argentine. After my loss to Daniel Strauss, I feel really disappointed. I have that second chance, so now I'm, I'm here to be the champion. After losing to Daniel Strauss in a quarterfinal matchup in last season's Bellator Featherweight Tournament, Malagari was given a second chance in this year's Summer Series bracket. Proving to the organization he was a legitimate signing, Malagari put on a grappling clinic against Jacob DeVries. After two failed submission attempts in the first two rounds, Naza proved that a third time is a charm, sinking in the guillotine choke in the third period. And there is the tap! Guillotine from the top position, and Nazareno Malagari is through to the semifinal round. While Malagari has proven to be durable, he will want to avoid Sandro's deadly right hand and lethal knees. I'm going to win again, I mean, and I will become the champion of Bellator. I respect everybody, but I want to fight here. It's the fight for the best for everybody here. A win for Sandro will put him one step closer to an eventual title shot and prove his worth as one of the top five 145 pounders on the planet. Marlon Sandro, he was the featherweight tournament favorite, but he had a pretty tough first round, tougher than expected against Janeiro Da Silva. What do you think he took away from that fight? He took away the fact that uh, Da Silva is a badass, and if Bellator doesn't bring this guy back, they are insane. So Marlon Sandro takes out, takes away from this fight that you know what, you can't take anybody lightly. Focus on the task at hand, and that is to take out your opponents as quickly as possible. Uh, use economy and uh, make sure that you get yourself into the tournament final. And I think Marlon Sandro will learn that coming out of the fight. Well, who do you predict? Let's hear your opinion again. We'll win this. I think it's going to be Sandro. I think he's going to keep this fight standing and absolutely brutalize Malagari to get himself into the final. And I think it will be him versus Ronnie Mann. God, oh God, that is going to be an epic encounter. Both Chris the Polish Hammer Hordeski and Chris the SoCal Kid Saunders will make their promotional debuts when they meet in the cage. Hordeski was released from the WEC after posting a 2-2 two two record, but is coming off a submission win over Dave Castillo. Saunders, who fought five times in 2010, hopes to keep his seven-fight win streak alive. One of Canada's top lightweights, Chris Hordeski, returns to Casino Rama to challenge 9-1 California native Chris Saunders. The 23-year-old Team Tompkins representative looks for a second straight victory after dropping a submission loss to highly touted WEC veteran Donald Cerrone. The Polish Hammer is not concerned with who's standing across the cage as he's coming off one of the best training camps of his career. Yeah, I'm ready for anything he can bring, uh, but you know he, he, he's, he's got a whole lot of uh, power coming at him. 
this extra week is definitely not going to benefit him. For me, I'm, I'm even hungrier um, than I ever was. We were just really worried he wasn't going to get to fight. It didn't matter to us who he was going to fight because this, and I'll tell you guys at home, has been the best camp I've ever had with Chris Wardeski. He's ready for anybody. The time of everybody saying that Team Tompkins is just strikers, I hope is over, or you're way behind in this sport. I think he understands, you know, the scope of every fight, you know, and it doesn't matter if you're in the UFC or if you're kind of on the verge of making it to the UFC, every fight is important, and Chris has got that, that killer instinct that he had back in the IFL. The Adrenaline Training Center co-owner will be fighting with a heavy heart as a close friend passed away only a week before his encounter with Saunders. Ordesky feels the mental preparation of martial arts training will help him through this tumultuous time. A close friend of mine passed away a couple days ago. Uh, I'm using you know, his energy right now uh, in the gym and, and uh, it's going to show come fight time. In a heavyweight bout, Neil Goliath Grove will collide with Zach Jensen. Grove, whose wins have all come by stoppage, has gone two and one with the promotion and is coming off a submission defeat to Cole Conrad at Bellator 32. In his most recent match, Jensen stopped Jason Ackerman in 16 seconds to break his three-fight losing streak. Stay with us as we take the show down to the ground and bring you a story on the gentle art known as Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Like, oh man, I wish I were in there, you know. Look to one of the major components in an MMA fighter's arsenal, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. A sport largely identified with the Gracie family, it became popular when Hoist Gracie won UFC tournaments 1, 2, and 4 in the early 90s. John Ramdi now brings us a story on the grappling sport. One key element of mixed martial arts, one might argue, is the art of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. With its roots coming from the Japanese discipline Judo, also known as the Gentle Way, BJJ puts emphasis on the Niwaza or ground battle. Although the art can appear soft and less effective to some casual observers, practitioners of the submission craft can inflict serious damage on numerous parts of their opponent's anatomy. He's got to really put his hips in. He's out! Three luminaries of the sport were recently around the provincial capital of Toronto to help spread the word of the fighting style they have dedicated their lives to. Rio de Janeiro native Marcus Soares has spent a lifetime honing his craft and feels the use of the kimono will only help with perfecting one's Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu technique. I like to get better because I think so you have way more options of submissions using the gear and the transition, for example, the guy training with the gear for no gear is very natural, it's very simple, the guy becoming a good fighter right away. None of the greats have ever trained without a gi. All of the greats train with gi. BJ Penn, Anderson Silva, the Nogueira brothers, all the guys who are at the top of the food chain all throw their gi, okay? If you, if you don't train with your gi, you miss the opportunities to fine tune your skills and make yourself a little bit stronger due to gi resistance. In my experience, training with the gi for all those years, when I take that gi off, I'm twice as dangerous without the gi. Recently, Soares promoted a number of his students, including Bama coach Mike Hong and Mecca owner Mark Stables, who despite training with jiu-jitsu royalties in the past, is proud to represent the late Carlson Gracie and Marcus Soares, a man many consider to be a founding father of Brazilian jiu-jitsu here in Canada. This is the first jiu-jitsu experience was in 94, I think, with Hoist and Horian came to do a seminar, and uh, you know that's when I got the bug, but most of my jiu-jitsu career with Marcus and, uh, and a great honor to, to be promoted. Uh, Marcus is, is, uh, is basically what I consider the father of jiu-jitsu in Canada because he was the first high-level guy, black belt from Brazil, to come and actually live in Canada. I created the family Carson Gracie team in Canada, you know, so I, I feel these people here like my, my sons here, you know, so I'm very glad that they grow the Carson Grace style of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu uh, in Canada, you know, all over the country. Two men who have made their mark in the sport in such a short period of time are Rafael and Gil Mendez. The two current world champions have their sights on establishing a legacy while helping with the growth of the sport. We met up with the youngsters at Pura BJJ in Hamilton. Our goal always 
or be champions and we always want to be the best in our division. The most important for us is we want to improve the Jiu-Jitsu, we want to create position, we want to, to put our name in the history. When I stop, the guys will be doing my positions. I'm so happy to be here, you know, our first affiliate here in Canada. And it's a great pleasure because uh, it's my dream, you know, I can share my Jiu-Jitsu with, with the world, with people who really want to improve. It's, it's a great honor to my students, you know, uh, help people to improve, not just in the mat, but in, on his life, you know. Three-time world champion Robert Drysdale has achieved greatness in both gi and no gi competition. A Las Vegas-based athlete has recently followed in the footsteps of former BJJ champions Roger Gracie, Damian Maya, BJ Penn and Strikeforce champion Jacare Souza by entering the world of mixed martial arts competition. The man who gave Forrest Griffin his BJJ black belt was at Musashi Martial Arts in Barrie, where he shared his thoughts on the differences between sport BJJ and MMA. You know, it's become less sport jiu-jitsu and more MMA-like, which is what I, what I wanted, uh, but they are different, you know, so there's a reason why Damian Maia doesn't compete jiu-jitsu anymore or Jacare, you know, it's, just, it's for obvious reasons, you can't, it's very difficult to, you know, be competitive on two different fronts, because the guys that are competing jiu-jitsu and winning, they're so specialized at that, and the guys at MMA, they're so specialized at that. I train jiu-jitsu twice a day, now I probably do it four times a week. So it's decreased, you know, it's not, I don't train with the same intensity I used to because I'm putting all this energy into striking. The Utah native has had a difficult journey when trying to achieve the level of success he has enjoyed in his grappling career. Over the last 10 years, the ADCC Kingpin has been trying to develop his art in an untraditional way. I've had teachers in the past, but pretty much since I've been a black belt, I've been kind of on my own, been kind of like a ronin, and kind of teaching myself, and it's hard, you know, like I, I think I could have done even better in my jiu-jitsu career had I, had I had like an instructor or like that mentor kind of figure next to me, but it's kind of been me on my own. I kind of got used to it, you know, I kind of, in a way it made me stronger because I'm my own mentor now. Like in my head, I, I know the things I have to work on. I try to correct myself, which requires a lot of discipline. If I have to not only try to get better, but try to notice the things I'm having problems with and have the discipline to correct those things. The undefeated mixed martial arts fighter does still get the urge to compete in grappling competitions and hasn't ruled out getting back on the mats before year's end. There are moments like whenever I, I go to a jiu-jitsu competition, I get that, you know, like, oh man, I wish I were in there, you know. I've kind of put a lot of focus in, uh, uh, into MMA lately and I don't have any plans on competing in jiu-jitsu anytime soon, but I'm considering it. You know, you have, you have the next Abu Dhabi coming up in September. I, had an, uh, I got an invitation. I'm considering it. I'm talking to some organizations about fighting in September. If I don't get this MMA fight, I'll probably compete in Abu Dhabi. Mixed martial arts has given many athletes from different martial arts disciplines, such as wrestling, Thai boxing, and BJJ, an opportunity to forge a new career path, but all must cross-train if they want to succeed at any level. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu 2 continues to grow on the global level, and with it new opportunities for students and teachers to earn a living while spreading the knowledge of the fighting art. After the break, we shift over to strictly jabs and punches as three titles are on the line in the boxing world. Let's go! This segment on the Fight Network is brought to you by The Ballroom, downtown Toronto's newest interactive entertainment centre. In the Sweet Science this weekend, Amir Khan and Zab Judah will trade fists at Mandalay Bay Resort and Casino in Las Vegas. Both fighters enter the bout with the title in hand, but only one will walk away as the unified kingpin. In his fifth WBA Super World Welterweight title defense, Amir Khan will trade fists with IBF light welterweight champion Zab Super Judah, who defends his title for the first time. Our boxing analyst, Corey Erdman, joins me now. Corey, let's talk about who trains these fighters. Amir Khan, he's trained by Freddie Roach, and Zab Judah, trained by the great Pernell Whitaker. Which camp has the edge here? Well, I can guarantee you, Sarah, that if Pernell Whitaker and Freddie Roach fought in their primes, that Pernell Whitaker would win. But since we're talking about trainers, you have to give the advantage to Freddie and Amir Khan when it comes to strategy. 
for Khan, he has a longer reach and youth on his side. So what does he have to do to ensure a victory here? I think he just has to stay active because this version of Zab Judah working with Pernell Whitaker is a little bit more defensive, a little bit more meek than the Zab Judah that we've seen before, the guy that used to throw a lot of flurries, a lot of combinations. If Amir can stay active and just throw in and around 60, 70 punches around, I think that Zab sort of goes into a shell and isn't going to be able to do much. This version of Zab Judah, the 2011 Zab Judah, he's only throwing in between 30 and 40 punches around. He's not going to be able to keep up with Amir if he can just stay active. Let's get to your prediction. <laughs> I think that Amir takes this one. I don't know that he's going to be able to get Zab out of there. I know that Judah has a, a shaky chin at times. So does Amir Khan. But again, working with Pernell Whitaker, I think that Zab's going to keep himself out of trouble. But I do think that he loses a decision in this one. In Mexico, current WBO featherweight champion Orlando Salido will face Japan's Kenichi Yamaguchi in a title match. Salido rebounded from a loss to pound-for-pound -pound contender Yuri Yorkis Gamboa before recording an eight-round TKO upset win over Juan Manuel Lopez to win the WBO title. Yamaguchi has earned a 17-1-2 record and prepares to challenge for his first major title. Corey, this bout is serving as somewhat of a tune-up match before Orlando Salida's rematch with Juan Manuel Lopez. So do you think he's already looking past Kenichi Yamaguchi? Well, if he looks past Yamaguchi in the ring, he's going to find Lopez in the front row. Apparently right. he's going to be <laughs> uh, in attendance. But you know what? Orlando Salido, he's been around the block. You take a look at his record. He's been in enough fights that he knows that he can't look past anyone and he's also been in Yamaguchi's spot before he's been that opponent so he knows better than to look past a guy like Yamaguchi I think he's going to be as focused as he ever has been so with that said how do you think it's going to end I see Salido getting him out of there in probably less than five rounds I'm pretty sure it's going to be a quick night for Orlando Salido the British heavyweight title is on the line when Tyson Fury takes on current champion Derek Chisora at Wembley Arena in London England the 6-foot-9-inch Fury has yet to be defeated and holds the English heavyweight title, while Chisora, who is also undefeated, stands at just 6-foot-1. Thank you to John Ramdean and Corey Erdman for joining me on the show today. That will be all, and remember, if you're ever looking for the latest fight news, visit our website, fightnetwork.com, and you can always tweet us on Twitter. Our handle is at FightNet. On behalf of the Fight Network, I'd like to thank The Ballroom for letting us use their space, and thank you for watching. We'll catch you next time. Born in Thailand, now living in England, Sengoku veteran Ronnie Kid Ninja Man is a classic example of mixed martial arts next generation. Pat Curran jumped at the chance to fill the last spot in the Bellator Season 2 155-pound lightweight tournament. Curran didn't remain unknown for long. Fighting for Bellator is truly a dream come true. I'm going to have a chance to take part in the biggest enemy tournament in the world today. I have that second chance, so now I'm, I'm here to be the champion. He's behind in, in another game. And that's